Is there anything better than a cozy casserole when the weather starts to cool down? With busy days and chilly nights, casseroles are the perfect solutions. They're easy to make, comforting, and full of flavor. This week, I've made three brand new casserole recipes, each one with its own unique twist and flavor profile, and every one was a hit with my family. As a sweet bonus, I'm sharing a fall-inspired churro dessert that puts a fun spin on a classic favorite. I can't wait for you to try them all, so let's get started. Today, I have a lineup of the very usual suspects that you see here a lot on my channel. I guess if I had a signature flavor, it would probably be sun-dried tomatoes. And today we're gonna make a sun-dried tomato chicken and cheese tortellini casserole. I can't wait. The first thing I'm gonna do is preheat the oven to 350 degrees. I'm also gonna get a pot of water on the stove up to a bowl to cook our tortellini in. And we're just gonna cook these according to the package directions. Mine are not a refrigerated tortellini, but just a shelf-stable tortellini. This one says to cook it about eight minutes, just whatever your bag of tortellini says. We don't have a lot of prep work for this recipe. I've just got one kind of small, medium-sized onion. I'm gonna rinse that off. I think I've showed you that trick before. That's just a little something that my mom has showed me to do that really keeps onions from burning your eyes. And I'm just gonna go ahead and dice up that entire onion. The other ingredient that I am gonna do a little chopping to are the sun-dried tomatoes. And you want to get the kind that is packed in oil, but you want to kind of drain the oil off of these. Don't throw it away, but we're gonna use a couple of tablespoons full of it. But when you're chopping these up, you do wanna get some of the oil off. And I'm gonna use pretty much this entire eight ounce jar. Sun-dried tomatoes give a wonderful flavor to any dish that you put them in. And I like to buy these that are already julienne chopped and then you don't have quite as much work to do if you want them cut up just a little bit smaller. But the oil and the herbs that these are packed in, it's full of flavor. This is one of my favorite pantry staple ingredients. I throw these in a lot of dishes, especially chicken dishes. Now, we're gonna set this to the side and let's get started in our skillet. Now, I have a huge oven safe skillet. So I just decided kinda last minute to use this. If you don't have an oven safe skillet, you can definitely transfer this over into a baking dish. But I'm pouring a couple of tablespoons of the oil out of the sun-dried tomatoes into my skillet and I'm getting it heated up on about a medium heat. Why not go ahead and saute our onions up in this delicious oil that those tomatoes were packed in? That's just gonna give it more flavor. These onions are smelling delicious. They're looking good and tender, sweated down. So let's go ahead and throw in couple teaspoons of some garlic. I'm just gonna finish out this little jar of minced garlic that I had in the fridge. Let that saute and get nice and fragrant in here, but you definitely don't wanna scorch it. Now we're gonna add in these diced sun-dried tomatoes, and we wanna put in a little chicken, and I'm gonna use the other half of this pulled rotisserie chicken breast that I have on hand. You could definitely cook your own chicken in the crock pot. You could even start this recipe by just browning up some chunked up chicken breast. But it's kind of a crazy day around here. If you notice, I'm cooking dinner pretty early. It's 2.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> it's one of those days where we're all going different directions and we've got things going on early morning and evening tonight. So I thought I would just cook us a nice big late lunch, early dinner today. I'm also gonna throw in some baby spinach. Grab that one. <laughs> About two cups, or I just say like two handfuls. They're really more than a handful. 
spinach wilts down to just basically nothing. And I really like a good bit of it in my dishes. So let's just cover it up and toss it around till it gets wilted down and does its thing. Gets all these flavors incorporated throughout all the chicken and all of the spinach. You can already see what a pretty colorful dish this is and how that spinach, it just wilts down to hardly nothing in here. Okay, friends, let's make it saucy and creamy. I'm adding in a cup and a half of chicken broth. I just keep the broth bases and mix it up as I need it. These are really great pantry items to keep. They don't take up a lot of space, like a huge carton of broth. You can get them in chicken, beef, vegetable, all kinds of varieties. I'm also adding in a cup of heavy cream. Oh, that's gonna make it good. Now let's give it just a little bit of salt. Don't need a whole lot. The tomatoes are, you know, pretty flavorful. I like to put a good bit of black pepper in pretty much everything I make. I'm also gonna use about a teaspoon of Italian seasoning. I'm extra generous with this. And I have some of this fresh dried basil. It stays good in the fridge for about a month and I love to buy these. Next year, I hope to have my own little herb garden and uh, be able to keep this for myself. But these are pretty potent, so I'm just using about a half a teaspoon of that. And let's give it a little stir and let it all cook down just a smidgen. At the end of summer, me and Maddie bought containers to do herb gardens. We're gonna do each herb in its own little container. So uh, when everything was clearanced out, we bought the stuff to do it in hopes of doing one this coming next year. I mean, that's a long ways off, but we're gonna try our hand at it anyway. While I've got my little dish here simmering, I'm gonna go ahead and drain my tortellini off and put it right over into here. Now I'm just gonna toss it around and get it all covered, swimming and coated with this delicious sun-dried tomato cream spinach mixture. Tortellini is something that I have really only been eating for about a year or so. I had myself convinced that I did not like it because I didn't like how it looked. <laughs> something about it just kind of turned me off but I kept seeing all kinds of delicious recipes with tortellini in it, and I tried them and I loved them. So something that I say a lot is don't be afraid to try new things, and even things that I used to not like for real, sometimes my tastes have changed. That's, that's happened to me, and I found later that I actually did enjoy something. So uh, I always try things out again a little bit later. You might find that you really like them. I've turned my stove eye off now, and if we didn't think this could get any better, I'm gonna top it with two cups of a mozzarella cheese. What self-respecting dish can call itself a casserole without cheese on the top of it? And I had just a handful of some grated Parmesan cheese or shredded Parmesan cheese in the fridge, so I'm gonna put that on top too. I'm gonna sprinkle it with just a little bit more Italian seasoning, just to give it that green color on the top, because I love that. And since this is gonna go in the oven, I'm gonna very carefully cover it with some aluminum foil, and I sprayed mine with nonstick spray. Don't want this aluminum foil to stick to my cheese and pull it off. Now, let's put her in the oven. And we're gonna cook that covered for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, gonna pull it out and take that foil off. Oh, I'm stuck to a tortellini or two. <laughs> Get back down there, cheese. Then I'm gonna put it back in the oven for about five to 10 more minutes and let it brown up on top just a little bit. Just gonna let this sit here 
for about five minutes before we dish it up. I've never been more excited to try something in all my life. About the time I pulled this out of the oven, Patrick and Maddie both showed up. We were all starved and we dug in. And friends, let me tell you, this is a 10 out of 10. I knew I would love it. Patrick, he's not so big on the spinach, but he loved this dish. He said, definitely put it on the rotation. If I could bottle up all of my favorite flavors, this right here would be it. Chicken, sun-dried, Tuscany, creamy pasta. It is delicious. It's perfect for fall, but honey, I'll be making this one year round. You're gonna love it give it a try. Now that we've got some cozy casseroles warming up the kitchen, let's talk about something that's been a real game changer when it comes to meal planning. That's Good Chop. It makes getting high quality meat and seafood easier than ever. I've been receiving Good Chop for well over a year now, and it's completely changed the way I stock my freezer and meal plan. With Good Chop, I get to fully customize my box with high quality meats and seafoods, and everything gets delivered right to my door on my schedule. No more running to the store last minute or worrying about quality. It's always top notch. Good Chop makes it so convenient. Everything comes vacuum sealed and flash frozen at peak freshness, so you can stock up and cook whenever you want. And with prices starting at just $3.32 a meal, I'm saving time and money, plus I'm getting top quality meat and seafood. And they offer over 70 cuts to choose from, so there's truly something for everyone. Whether you're craving the 100% grass-fed ribeyes, wild-caught salmon, prime filet mignon, or free-range chicken breast. And something great that sets Good Chop apart from the rest is that all of their products are sourced exclusively from farms and fisheries in the USA, supporting local independent ranchers and family farms. I love that their meats are free from antibiotics, added hormones, and artificial ingredients. Just pure high quality food. And if for any reason you're not happy, they've got a 100% money back guarantee. I've tried so many of their options and month after month, every single one has impressed me. If you're looking for a way to get high quality meat and seafood without all the hassle, go to goodchop.com slash YouTube and use code MAMAMALE130 or click the link in the caption below to get $130 off across your first four boxes. Let me know what cuts you're going to try first and don't miss this great savings of $130 off across your first four boxes. That's at goodchop.com slash YouTube. Use code MAMAMALE130. Mail 130. All the details will be in the description box below. And thank you, Good Chop, for being a longtime supporter of the channel. Oh gosh, that is good. That is delicious. Today, we're going to make a Philly cheese steak casserole. It doesn't take many ingredients at all, but it's going to be full of flavor. We're even going to make a little bread. So it's going to be just like eating a Philly cheese steak sandwich. Going to get my oven preheated to 375 degrees. I've got my meat thawing out in the microwave and we're gonna start with some Bisquick. I'm using a cup and I'm actually halving this casserole recipe. I'm actually using this Kroger baking mix, which is the same thing as Bisquick. So you can use either one of those. This is gonna serve as a base, kinda like the bun for our Philly cheesesteak casserole. Gonna stir in a half a cup of milk. Now let's crack in one egg. And we just wanna get this combined really well. I may need just a little more splash of milk in mine. We will see. Yep, I'm gonna give mine just a little splash of milk. I didn't pour quite the entire half cup in the little measuring cup. I'm gonna put just a pinch of black pepper into my Bisquick. I just want to give it a little zhuzh of something. And I bet if you wanted to use the Red Lobster Cheddar Bay Biscuit stuff, that would be a nice take on this. Now I've got an eight by eight square baking dish. Of course, I'll have the full entire recipe linked below for you. It would make a nine by 13 casserole dish, but this is all I need for tonight. 
And it's the first time I've ever made this one, so I'm anxious to see how it turns out, you know, before I fully commit. <laughs> Just gonna get my spatula to make sure that I get everything out of here and get it smoothed down. Get it nice and evenly spread across here. Now I'm just gonna set it aside and let's get our ground beef started. While I've got my brown, not my brown, <laughs> I have my ground beef started over on top of the stove. I'm gonna cut my veggies up. And quite honestly, it only called for one bell pepper for the entire recipe. So I could probably just get away with half of that little green one but I have a red and a green, and I just think that they're going to be so pretty in this diced up. So I'm going to use a little bit of each one of those. I think this is going to be plenty of red and plenty of green. And I do want it diced up into pieces, not strips like you would on a sandwich. We're going to be eating this casserole style. So we want all of our pieces to be little and bite-sized. And any of this bell pepper back here that I don't get eaten this week, I'm just gonna dice it up and put it in the freezer. And then you would have bell peppers on hand, frozen, you could throw in any recipe. Didn't forget my little onion on here. I'm just using about half of this pretty small onion to begin with. Gonna dice it up nice and little too. There is really not much grease in this ground beef, but I am just gonna use a little paper towel and kind of blot down in here and get up the excess. I don't want a whole lot of grease in this dish. And I like to do that before my meat is like fully cooked. Now we'll just break up any of the big pieces that I've not gotten broken up yet. You can see this comes together so quickly. And I am just gonna take my onions and my bell peppers and toss them in. Want to give them time to get softened up. Oh, it looks like Christmas in here. <laughs> I'm gonna give this a pinch of black pepper. I am not gonna use any salt because we're gonna be using some brown gravy packet mix and that's pretty salty. But I am gonna give it a nice, you know, healthy spoonful, maybe another half of some minced garlic. Cut my heat down a little bit. Just gonna let this cook maybe three more minutes. The meat's fully cooked. I just want my onions and peppers and all that to sweat out a little bit and get a little bit more tender. Now I have one of these envelopes of just brown gravy mix, and I'm going to do my best to guesstimate about half of this mix in here. Then I'm going to put in a half a cup of water, and we're going to get all this incorporated. This gives you that just wonderful, beefy flavor, and I have a confession to make. I honestly don't like a Philly cheesesteak sandwich. It's the texture. I don't like the stringy meat that's on it. I love ground beef. I love it in a casserole like this where it's all, you know, chopped up. But uh, we've got a local place in the mall over in Knoxville. Well, I don't know if it's local. It's like a Charlie's Cheesecake sandwich. It might be a, a chain, but uh, they do turkey and ham, I think too. They have delicious fries, but my mom always gets that cheesecake sandwich. And it looks and smells so good, but I just don't like that stringy meat. So I am super excited to try this. You just want to let that kind of simmer for a couple minutes till most of the liquid like evaporates out of this. And by me just using half of the recipe is really not taking long for this to get evaporated and get nice and thick. Now we have not forgotten our Bisquick mix over here. We're gonna take this cheesesteak filling and we're gonna put it right on top of our Bisquick. I honestly think I might have been able to make a nine by 13 with just one pound of hamburger meat, but this one will be nice, thick, and hearty. 
and we didn't pre-bake that bisquick in case there's any confusion. I just had it set to the side. When I mix up toppings like that, like cornbread or anything like that, I like to let it sit a few minutes before I cook it anyway. Just seems to help it rise up a little bit more. And I'm so glad we had red and green bell peppers. That makes it so pretty. Now I'm just taking some slices of provolone cheese. We don't want to be stingy here. Let's let them overlap a little bit. Make sure we get it all covered. A little extra there. And we're going to put this in that 375 degree oven for about 20 to 25 minutes. And I have my aluminum foil here. Just in case the top gets too brown, I can cover it while it's continuing to cook. Sure enough, I had forgotten that I have a bag of the little baby mini sweet peppers to crunch and munch on this week. So, I'm just going to dice these red and green ones up, put them in the freezer, and I'll thank myself one day in the future when I go to make, you know, a meatloaf or soup or something, I'll have these good to go. Oh my gosh. This thing looks beautiful after 15 minutes. I do have a feeling that 15 minutes is not long enough. Yeah, I don't think the Bisquick is done. I don't know. It looks pretty coming out pretty clear. Let's check the middle again. That might have just been cheese. Tell you what I'm going to do. To be safe and not sorry, I'm going to cover mine with aluminum foil and I'm going to stick it back in the oven for at least another five minutes. That would be a total of about 20 minutes. After five minutes, I uncovered mine and let it brown up just a little bit more. Oh my gosh, it looks so good. And we're just going to let this sit for about 10 minutes before we cut into it. All right, Dad, let's give it a try tonight. Do you like Philly cheesesteak? Mm -hmm. See, I don't, but I think I'm gonna like this. Try to let it cool. That won't be a good shot. I'm not hanging on my mouth. <laughs> That's all right. Look at the cheese pull. Oh my gosh. It's very good, buddy. Very good. Mmm. I like that. You can taste those peppers. Mm-hmm. It kind of makes me think of um, that cheeseburger in Paradise that's made with the Bisquick. Kind of makes mm -hmm. me think of that. A little bit. If you it's were into... Cut with the cheese. <laughs> it's so cheesy. I think if you were into mushrooms, like we're not, but I think that would kind of go with this. Mm. Jalapenos. Mm-hmm. It's Spice good. it up any way you want. It's very good. Does it taste like the flavors in a chili chili cheese steak? It does to me. Cool. I think it's really good. Look at that bisquick layer. I think that is so good. Look at the steam coming off of it. It's hard to eat. It's so hot. Hmm. I like it. It's very good, Mom. Right. Thumbs up. I got a thumb. You got a thumb good. today. Well, let's go eat, Dad. Today, I'm making a brand new chicken casserole I've never made before. This is a poppy seed chicken casserole. I'm putting in a lot of little extras here. Do you have to do this? No. If you don't like an ingredient in here, just leave it out. But honey, these are just going to make chicken casserole great again. I can't wait. Got a late start going on today. I'm gonna preheat my oven to 350 degrees, and I've got a package of this pulled rotisserie chicken. This has become one of my most favorite little handy helpers. This container 
It's getting thrown everywhere. <laughs> I'm having a rough time today. <laughs> These containers have a pound of this rotisserie chicken in them. I don't always use the whole container in a casserole. This stuff really goes a long way. It's like I've got about half of it out here. If I see any big pieces, I just like to go ahead and chop them up into a little bit smaller bite-sized pieces, especially since this is gonna be for casserole. You ever have those days where you just start out dropping stuff in the morning and then all day long, you're just dropping stuff and making messes all day. That's kind of what I've been into. This chicken looks good to me. And I've got about two or two and a half cups of this chicken going in my bowl. I think that looks like plenty for a nine by 13 casserole. Into our chicken, I'm gonna put about a half a cup of sour cream. I'm just eyeballing this. I'm gonna use one can of this cream of chicken soup with herbs. This has a really delicious flavor, but if you don't have this, you can use just regular cream of chicken. You could also use cream of mushroom. You could even mix it up and do cream of celery or cream of broccoli or cream of potato. Now let's give it some really good flavor with a teaspoon of garlic powder, a teaspoon of onion powder. Let's give it a good teaspoon full of pepper. Then let's back it down to about a half a teaspoon of salt. Those soups are pretty salty. Now we're just gonna get all of this mixed together and combined. And like I said, I feel like this is plenty enough as I was saying, I feel like this is plenty enough chicken and plenty enough of soup and sour cream mixture in here to go into a nine by 13 casserole dish. Now, let's set this aside and do our topping. For our topping, I'm gonna start by melting a full stick of butter in the microwave. And while that butter is melting down, I'm gonna use the inside of this wrapper to grease my casserole dish. We don't want to waste one little smidgen of this gold, gold butter. Now that I have my butter melted, I'm just gonna do some stuff to it. I'm not measuring, but I'm just gonna sprinkle in some Italian seasoning, a little bit of parsley flakes, a little bit of garlic powder, a little bit of onion powder, and I'm getting spicy, just the littlest bit of red pepper flakes. And I'm just gonna mix that together. And what I have done here is just made an herb butter. You can buy garlic and herb butter, but it's really expensive. I just made up my own here. Like I said earlier, all of that step right there was not necessary, but I wanted to do that. And the one thing that I am going to measure is my poppy seeds, and I'm using a tablespoon of those. Let's go ahead and incorporate that. Here's another item I had on hand, and I just thought it would make this topping extra good and crunchy. I'm gonna use probably a half a cup of these sliced almonds in this topping. Again, not necessary but it's gonna be delicious. Now I'm just mushing up one sleeve of Ritz crackers. One sleeve might do it since I've put the um, almonds in. I feel like I'm gonna open this and it's gonna go everywhere. <laughs> there we go. Whoops. If you don't wanna be chaotic mess like I am, you could put these in a Ziploc bag and crush them up like that. But honey, we're just getting supper done here today. We're just getting it done. Now let's get our cracker crumbs all mixed in to this garlic butter. Get these almonds all combined in here. And this, it looks and smells so buttery and so delicious. Now with my poppy seeds, a lot of people like to put the poppy seeds into the actual casserole. I've seen it both ways. I've seen it in the casserole. I've seen it in the topping. I've seen it in both places. I just prefer to put it on the topping because I kind of like how it looks. Now let's bring our buttered casserole dish back over and dump this chicken and soup mixture into it. 
and let's get it all spread out. You can see the herbs from the soup, the black pepper. Oh, there's a lot of goodness in here. Sour cream gives it a little tang. I have went back and forth about putting some shredded cheese in here before this topping. But you know what? I think we've been decadent enough. I'm just going to leave it as it is tonight. But if you want to throw some cheddar cheese, some white cheddar, I think would be good, or Gruyere, or Swiss, I think any of those pretty white cheeses would go really nicely down in here. Now, look at that cracker crumb topping. Doesn't that look delicious? And I'm actually gonna put a few more crackers in this one. These were store brand, and I honestly don't think there's as many in a sleeve of these <laughs> as there are Ritz. But there's plenty of butter down in here to go around, so I'd probably use maybe a quarter of that sleeve more. Get that all mixed up. Now we're gonna take this topping and spread it all over this casserole. And full transparency, I put a little bit more crackers in here. Honey, that's what cooking is all about. Trust yourself, trust your judgment. If you think you want a little bit more of something, try it. Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. <laughs> but you never know until you try it out. This casserole looks good enough to eat already. I love the poppy seeds and I love the almonds. I love that little crunch and texture. And I also think they look so pretty down in here, even before they're cooked up. It just makes this casserole really, really interesting looking. And we're not gonna cover this casserole to bake it. We're just gonna put it straight into this 350 degree oven for 30 minutes. I was just gonna have a salad with this tonight. But I happened to remember that I had about a half a bag of these little petite gold potatoes. So I just washed them up. I'm going to quarter them up and make us some mashed potatoes. I love green beans and mashed potatoes with a chicken casserole. Really any casserole. It's one of those things you want that with meatloaf and casseroles. For a lot of you guys who have been here for a long time, this is just gonna be review for you. Doctored up canned green beans, and I'm just using one regular size can, 14, 15 ounces. These are Aldi brand. I'm gonna throw in a tablespoon of butter. If I have bacon grease, I throw a little bit of that in. If not, I just drizzle a little bit of oil in ours because we like them greasy. Give them a little bit of salt, fair amount of pepper, I've got some of these real bacon pieces, like what you get to put on salads. I'm gonna throw in a little bit of that. Now, my friend, Denissa, who I originally got this recipe from, she used soy sauce, but we have found that we actually prefer it with a little Worcestershire sauce. We're just not big soy sauce fans. What really makes them good now is a couple big tablespoons of brown sugar. These are gonna be like a country style, cooked all day green bean that just takes you a few minutes. Get it all mixed together, and I mean, I cook them hard. I cook them back here till about all of this liquid's gone. If this is not a fall casserole, I just don't know what is. I like to use a hand masher to mash up my potatoes before I add in my milk, and I start with just a splash of milk couple little pats of butter, and I like to throw in a big spoonful of sour cream in this case. Sometimes I'll use mayonnaise, I've used cream cheese, whatever I have on hand, just a little extra flavor to it that just using milk and butter didn't give it. Now, even when I'm using like regular Idaho potatoes, I don't peel my potatoes. I like them to have the skins on, and I like mine to be a little more lumpy too. I like a rustic looking mashed potato. Like a good little bit of black pepper in mine. Just a smidgen more salt. Let's get it all mixed together and give them a taste. Perfect. This is probably one of the best new chicken casseroles that I've ever made. I love the almonds on the top of it, the poppy seeds, 
and using those extra little herbs in the butter gave this so much flavor. This one is definitely a keeper, friends. I am so excited about this one. I mean, this just screams fall to me. This is such a cozy casserole, warm. Mmm, oh my gosh, I love the nuttiness on the top of it. Of course, we love Ritz crackers and better, but those almonds, that takes it over the top. And greasy green beans with brown sugar. Don't knock it till you try it, friends. <laughs> mm. This is just a perfect fall dinner, friends. Mm -mm -mm. Today, we're going to make some Rice Krispie treats, but these are not your normal Rice Krispie treats. These are churro flavored or snickerdoodle rice crispy treats gonna be so much fun the first thing i'm gonna do is prep my pan for rice crispy treats i'm going with a 9 by 13 pan you could definitely make them in an 8 by 8 or a 9 by 9 i mean you make them suckers thick i'm taking these to sunday dinner at my mom's so i'm doing you know thinner and bigger pan taking a piece of parchment paper <laughs> and I wadded it up <laughs> because I've just found that parchment paper will form to your pan better if it's kind of been crinkled up and spraying the pan first kind of helps keep your parchment kind of stuck to the pan a little for lack of a better word kind of helps it stay in place now I'm just going to spray my parchment one more time so my treats will lift off easier. <laughs> I need to back up to my pan fixing up here because I forgot to tell you guys, I like to sprinkle a couple of tablespoons of cinnamon sugar all along the bottom of this pan. I just kind of do it like when you're flour dusting a cake pan or something like that. It's going to get you some real churro-like goodness when you put these in. To make cinnamon sugar, I'm just using a half a cup of granulated sugar. And I'm going to start with a tablespoon of ground cinnamon. You can use more or less to your liking. You could even add things in like pumpkin pie spice and nutmeg and cloves if you're, you know, wanting a little bit of an extra flavor. Just mixing it all together, and I can kind of tell by the color if this is going to be cinnamony enough for me. I think that this half a cup will be more than enough for what I need for today's recipe. But if by some chance I use all this, and I hope to the Lord I don't use all this today, but it's super easy to whip up cinnamon sugar, and this looks like a perfect ratio to me. Now, I'm an old school Rice Krispie maker. I like to make them on top of the stove. I've made them in the microwave before. Works fine, but I like to make them on top of the stove. I'm putting in five tablespoons of butter. We've got our heat on like a medium low. Let that go nice and slow and get melted down. Now, I have my pan prepped. I'm also getting all my Rice Krispies measured out because if you're familiar with Rice Krispie treats, you know, you have to move fast when you're making these. And I'm using a total of six cups of Rice Krispie cereal. I'm just using the regular cereal and I'm adding the cinnamon sugar to mine. Now, if you can find the cinnamon sugar Rice Krispies, you could use about four cups of that and then two cups of regular and leave that cinnamon sugar out, but I can't find those anymore. Now that my butter's on the way to melting down, I'm just gonna give my little spatula a spray. That'll help it not stick whenever I'm mixing things in. And I'm gonna sprinkle in about a half a teaspoon of some real fine sea salt. Salt in sweet dishes just really helps bring out that flavor. Just a little bit goes a long ways. Now let's talk about our marshmallows. I like using the mini marshmallows. I think they just melt in a whole lot easier and you want them to be good and fresh. 
and we're going to use a lot of them. I'm going to end up using about two of these 10 ounce bags. My experience has been one of these 10 ounce bags gets you about six or seven cups of marshmallows. And I'm going to stir in about eight right now. So about a bag and a half of these 10 ounce sizes. And we're just going to mix this into our butter nice and slow and let everything come together. Now, you can cancel me for using all of these marshmallows if you want to, but we don't eat these all the time. This is a treat. And it, like I said, it's just been my experience that the more the marshmallows, the better. Have you ever bit into a Rice Krispie treat and that thing be so hard that it would about break your teeth? Marshmallows help that. Don't skimp on the butter or the marshmallows because that is what is going to give your Rice Krispie treat its gooiness instead of its hardness. It's going to keep them nice and soft and just do this on low heat and be patient. We want these to be gooey and delicious. We don't want them to be hard <laughs> and pull our teeth out or break our teeth off. See how patience pays off. It's just getting so smooth and good looking. And you wanna do this on a lower medium heat because you don't want this to crystallize. That's another thing that would make your Rice Krispie treats really hard is if you melt your marshmallows too quick and too hard and they just get, you know, turn into like crystallized sugar. That's going to make your treats harden up. Mine looks like it is almost melted all the way down. So I'm going to turn my heat off and I'm going to pour in a little bit of vanilla. I'm just going to use about a quarter of a cup not a quarter of a cup, a quarter of a teaspoon. <laughs> That'd be a lot of vanilla, wouldn't it? <laughs> Get that all mixed in here. And I'm also going to take about a third of a cup of that cinnamon sugar that I mixed up and pour that in. And we want to get that mixed in nice and quick. I'm going to go ahead and remove this from the heat over here, even though the heat's off. I don't want it on this hot stove eye. And it is smelling like pure heaven right here over top of this pot. And I'm using all this cinnamon sugar. Like I said, I can't find the cinnamon sugar Rice Krispies anymore. So I just add the cinnamon sugar into my marshmallow mixture. Now, real quick, let's start adding our Rice Krispie treats. There goes two cups. Now here comes about another two cups. I like to mix mine in just a little bit at a time. And here comes the last two cups. Now let's get all these combined in here. The cinnamon sugar gives it a really pretty warm cinnamon color too. To me, there's nothing that says home and old school than to stand at the stove and mix up a big batch of Rice Krispie treats for your family. Now we've got just a couple of cups left of these marshmallows. And I love to do this at the end of mixing my Rice Krispie treats, just to pour the little mini marshmallows in here. And they're not gonna get melted so much but you'll be able to see them in your bars and it makes it really pretty. And it's another thing that just keeps your Rice Krispie treats a little bit fluffier and a softer texture is to have those little bits of marshmallows not melted through every little bite. I say all the time when I'm cooking and sharing recipes, that it's just the simplest little things that you do that you add in to recipes sometimes that make all the difference. An extra seasoning that you throw in, just a little extra step of putting something on the top, throwing a sauce together. Those kind of things can just so simply elevate a little dessert like a Rice Krispie treat 
and make it, you know, holiday worthy. <laughs> Rice Krispie treats always make me think of the fall and Halloween too, because these marshmallows, when they're melting down, it looks like spider webs <laughs> when you're stirring it together. Now we get to the good part. We're gonna dump all of this little mixture out into our prepared dish. Oh my gosh, it's so sticky. <laughs> but it's so good. I don't like to leave any little bit behind. And I'm just going to gently spread these out into this 9 by 13 dish. Another thing you don't want to do is press them together real hard because that's another thing that will kind of harden your treats up a little bit. Another little trick that I like to do is to spray the bottom of the little measuring cup and just gently use that just to press these out a little bit. Try not to press them down too hard. We just want to get to each corner. The nonstick spray really helps these gooey Rice Krispie treats not stick to this cup. We just kind of want to get an even little layer across here. You could, of course, just spray your hands and use them or use another piece of like parchment paper and use your hands to press it. But I already had this out and had it dirty, so there we go. And you know, if you are familiar with a churro, the very best part of a churro is all the cinnamon sugar that is coated on the outside of it. So I'm taking another couple tablespoons of the cinnamon sugar and sprinkling it over the top of the Rice Krispies. I'm just gonna let them sit here for a couple minutes and then we'll cut into them. And for everybody that's wondering, that's how much cinnamon sugar I had left. <laughs> when you're ready to cut your treats, you just lift them out and put them on a cutting board. I like to spray just an old butter knife to cut mine with. It doesn't have to be super sharp. I just find that these are easier to cut them with. And since mine are a little more not thick, a little more on the flatter side, I'm cutting them into nice, generous size pieces. I mean, do you get Rice Krispie treats this big anywhere else except Mama Mel's? <laughs> if we want to, we can cut them up a little bit smaller. Honestly, these were a little bit bigger than I intended. Here they are. I'm going to try a bite. I love the way that you can still see some of the marshmallows in here and you have the cinnamon over the top. I love that. Look how soft and gooey these are. I mean, oh my gosh. <laughs> that must dry by. Mm. Oh my gosh. They're so gooey, so soft. There's you a good shot of the little marshmallows that I folded in at the end. The cinnamon. Chef's kiss. I can't make it because it's just stuck to my finger. Mmm. Do I make these? I got a happy family today. <laughs> Click here to see more quick and easy, delicious recipes. And friend, thank you so much for choosing to spend some of your day with me. I don't ever take that for granted. Until next time I see you, I send you love from my kitchen.